Hello again. In this podcast, I talk to David Plummer. Uh, David is a wildlife photographer who's based in southern England, and he's been a wildlife photographer for some time. He's also got into videography and consulting, and uh, in this podcast, he talks about that. He's also been suffering with Parkinson's disease for the last few years, and this has made a big impact on his photography, as he explains in the uh, in the, in the recording that's coming up. Now, um, I do apologise for the sound quality. It's not as good as I would have liked. We had to sort of look for a venue B um, to record David, but I hope you get enough from it to feel inspired. So here's the podcast. Okay, so so I'm here with uh, David Plummer, and David is has been, I should say, a wildlife photographer, but also has is a lot more than that, and. Um, has quite an amazing story. And I, I don't really want to preempt it because David can tell his story obviously far better than I can. And we've just been having a chat here about how we're going to go about this talk. And I think what we'll do is, as we discussed, just talk about maybe how you got started, David, and the kind of way, you, and, and we'll let the journey <laughs> kind of un, unfold from that mm. point. So I'll hand over to you. Quite long and convoluted. <laughs> That's okay. So yeah, thanks for having me on. Thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Pleasure, pleasure. So uh, how I got started? Um, I've been into wildlife since the earliest age, really. Um, it's my first memories. I remember playing with wood lice on my mum's coffee table, <laughs> and uh, and she probably found it pretty disgusting. Um, but you know, I, I went through the whole childhood you know didn't go to school very much and uh might be familiar with some people and and I started wildlife photography probably at about the age eight or something like that wow. as soon as I got my first SLR camera but then in those days buying a long lens was really prohibitive and you know, I was reduced to photographing blue tits in the garden with a, you know, just a canvas sheet. And, um, and but it, it hooked me and I, I've continued ever since. And, um, yeah, it's just a thing that's totally grown. That's great. And then how did your career, be, well, you know, when you got a bit older, how did that begin to unfold? So presumably you did start getting some telephoto lenses and got to be more creative with your photography. Yeah, I, I actually uh, was a was a police officer for eight years, okay. uh, nine years, and two years of those I was sent to the Caribbean, which was quite pleasant. Um, and then when I came back, I, I thought I'd leave because I needed more adventure in yeah. my life. And um, so um, I... Photography was still going, so I started investing in really quite rubbish lenses at the time. Um, I remember going to you know, secondhand sales of kit and just picking up any lens. But I, that that's when I really decided I'm going to follow this professionally. Uh, I remember being in British woodland, sort of with my knees soaking wet because I was photographing flowers at springtime, and I just thought, I want to do this forever. This is this is what I want to do, and um, and I I just became obsessed. I've never done a single lesson in photography or um, filming or anything like that. I'm totally self-taught. Yeah. Um, but it, it becomes an overriding passion, and um, and I think that's the most important aspect. You've got to have that passion, yeah. And it's also good to to start learning on a budget. Um, if if you've got, I mean, we're we're all probably gadget freaks and lens freaks, and and think life would be perfect if we have that seven thousand pound lens. But the reality is, if you only have a, a lens that's a couple of hundred pounds, you, you learn the limitations of your kit. Not only the limitations of your kit, but how you're going to work around it to still get good images. Um, and so you, you 
is not hacking, but you you develop your field craft because you've got to get closer to your subject. Um, and this was in the days of transparency film. So I think I calculated every image I took was cost 30 pence when in film stock because I used to use Fuji Velvia rated at ISO 50 then. Yeah. Um, so by the time you've bought that, which isn't cheap, and by the time you've had it processed, that's about 30 pence an image. So I re- I've got notebooks from those years, which have got every single exposure reading that <laughs> I took on every image, yeah. um, because I couldn't afford to make mistakes. And um, and I think you become a master of, of exposure on on. Especially transparency because it, it's unforgiving. Gives you no opportunity to get it wrong. Um, you can't correct it subsequently, or you can do very little in editorial. And now we, we live in the, the age of digital photography, and I think that sometimes people just sort of spray and pray and hope that the yeah. camera gets it right every now and then. And and I think the most important aspect is to learn your craft. Um, yeah. learn how to photograph, learn reciprocity law. And once you learn that, then everything in photography is based on reciprocity law. And if you learn that, and it's normally the bit in the books that everyone avoids because it's got maths involved, they all go yeah. to a composition page because it's got nice pictures. Yeah. Um, but they, they ignore but just the basics, and, and I think if you learn that, and, and just it doesn't take long, just a day devoted to that, and you learn the beautiful, beautiful mathematics of, of photography. Well, it opens the door to your creativity, doesn't it? It, it releases the potential of whatever camera you're using, because if yeah. you don't understand that, you're forever, you know, limited. It's a very narrow. There's very little you can do ultimately. Whereas to really yeah. open the door, you've just got to understand it. Yeah, yeah, and I, I remember the note. I had notebooks, and I used um, um, slide film as well. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, and I got very sparing with which photographs I took. <laughs> exactly, because you know, one, your frame rate was really slow anyway, um, and two, it was just so horrendously expensive. Yeah, and you didn't know what you got until five days later. Oh, exactly. Yeah, and that was. That was why I had the notebook, and I, I would yeah. I talked to people about days of film and kind of how the, the older people among us <laughs> learnt to uh, <laughs> take photographs and put it that way. <laughs> the more mature, <laughs> yeah. Middle so, age gets young, gets older and older as I get older and older. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I don't know what's going on there. I find the same thing. <laughs> it's all a bit of a letdown. Um. So you began teaching and doing courses, and you were doing that for for a while. And I think you're still doing some of it, aren't you? Um, yeah, how did yeah. how did that develop? Quite simply, I was asked to, and it's um, I've always worked with conservation groups. So I've worked with Sussex Wildlife Trust since 1999, I think, or the year 2000. Um, they're my local wildlife trust, and you know they gave me a lot of support and actually asked me to teach uh, photography courses, sort of beginning wildlife photography courses. And nothing teaches you a subject like teaching it, yeah, uh, because you get asked a lot of questions and you have to know the answers. Yeah, although it's always good to be prepared to say I don't know the answer rather than pop people off. Absolutely. Um, and 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 it, it really taught me a lot running courses. And and let's face it, wildlife photography, which I pretty much specialised in all, all my career, is hard to make a living. And yeah. it becomes a lifestyle in in effect. Yeah. And I've I've developed a lot of skills around photography that have led to other forms of employment, guiding, teaching. Um, consultancy work uh, for film companies and it becomes a lifestyle and in reality I, I could 
possibly not take another image for the rest of my life and be relatively happy. Yeah. But if I couldn't see wildlife every day, that would be the end for me. It's, it's the wildlife that is of greatest priority to me. Yeah, I think it's so powerful. I think for most of us, even if we're not conscious of it, to just be able to connect with nature in some yeah. way. Um, whether that's just going out in the garden and looking at the birds or being able to go somewhere where you you can see animals in their own environment. There's just yeah. something I think yeah, that yeah. really takes us out of the day-to-day -day nonsense that we it's so easy to get drawn into. Yeah. I think COVID, the pandemic, brought nature home to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I've, I felt a little bit guilty. I live right in the countryside. My rear fence boundaries the south downs national park so yeah. for me first lockdown was great i must admit because it was like it was in a science fiction film where no one was everyone had disappeared yeah and all there was were animals um i noticed that the wildlife drifted closer to roads during the first lockdown yeah because there were there's a hell of a lot less traffic and then as soon as traffic started again that they all sort of spread out from the road um but i think the pandemic definitely brought nature to people um yeah. and, and they started appreciating things so i've not seen seen so many references to bird song and how people were now listening to bird song yeah because there was no ambient noise no uh, traffic and no airlines and going over or anything like that so yeah I think it really helped people yeah yeah and you were talking about the consultancy and the the projects and we were speaking about the projects just before we started recording do you want to talk a, a bit more about that side of things because that that sounds very interesting the work you're getting involved with um in that area now yeah so um one I think if I had my main strength in wildlife photography is fieldcraft. Um, and I really developed that. And I think that was because I couldn't afford long lenses um, early on. And, and I have this obsession with wildlife and animal behavior. So I, I sort of developed methods of, of getting close to wildlife and and setting up shots that would otherwise be quite difficult to get. And so I was asked to consult for various wildlife documentary companies. Um, and now that's forming quite a major part of income. Um, I, I think the, the production companies have, have had difficulty accepting the role because they used to, say, a volunteer at a nature reserve, showing them where whatever species they're going is. But I, I took it a step beyond and was setting hides up and putting crew in just the right place at just the right time for the backlight. And, um, and so I was encouraged by some of these crews because I became very friendly with them um, to, to start filming myself. And, I started filming, but definitely the consultancy is um, is very enjoyable. I really, yeah. I really like it, and I think the role is being more accepted. Um, I mean, the latest thing is the new is a landmark David Attenborough series just about to be released, and next week we've got the screening in London, and it's just. I mean, it's one of the highlights of my career, I think, just to be involved in, you know, a huge David Attenborough series. It's like everyone's dream. And, and Absolutely. Yeah. And it's funny how those one thing leads to another, leads to another, and then suddenly you're in this yeah. place where you're you're getting involved in those kind of projects. And the busier you are, the busier you get. Yeah. Because yeah. you're out there. Yeah. Um. I want to talk about something else, and that is obviously that. Well, I say obviously, but you developed Parkinson's disease a, a little while ago, and do you, do you want to talk about that? And you've got your book as well, the Seven Years of Camera Shake. Um, yeah. So, if if you'd like to just talk about that and 
I guess, how you realise what was going on and the impact that's had in doing your work and your approach to your work? Yeah, so it was 2009 and I was editing on the computer, as we all do now, and I just yeah. noticed a tremor in my left arm. Yeah. Uh, and to cut a long story short, nine months later, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease at right. age 39, I think. And right. um, so that was 14 years ago. And it's it's quite an axe blow. You know, the axe falls and you think my career as a photographer is over. And, um, you know, the, your initial thoughts with something like that is, you know, why did it happen to me? Why have I had this? And I realised that's stupid questions to ask yourself. Mm. It, it's it's a fait accompli. It's already happened. There's nothing you can yeah. do about it. Yeah. So you've got no control over anything that happens to you. The only thing you've got total control over is how you react to it. Yeah. And so I just decided, or well, sorry, I'm just going to get on with things. I've not got long. I didn't know how long. I, I remember a neurologist said when I was diagnosed, you've got between two and two to three years of function left, which was quite frightening at the time. So from then I was in a race to get things done. I mean, in a perverse sense, Parkinson's disease has been the best thing that ever happened to me right. because I, I, I have no excuses now. Um, if I don't do it now, I might not be able to do it next week or next month or next year. Yeah. So I, I just get on with it. And um, consequently, it's led to a greater production in work um, and, th and therefore a greater sort of creativity and also lots more opportunity as well because I've become involved in sort of disability, um, you know, opportunities and and trying to champion people who are sort of disadvantaged in, in in the area both at home and abroad actually yeah yeah do, do you want to say more about that side of your work um yeah I've recently I, I mean yeah I produced a book of called seven years of camera shape which did quite well um it, it Certainly brought things to the to the limelight, as it were, both photographically and awareness of Parkinson's in, in this country. Um, but I recently went to work in Sri Lanka, and it was the the first place I've been long haul since COVID, and I'm worse now. And um, so my symptoms are much more obvious, and um, I was I was subject to quite a degree of stigmatisation um, from. I mean, there's no offence to people of that nation, but there's cultural beliefs around uh, disability and and things like Parkinson's disease, and it was it was quite unpleasant. I mean, we. I think disabled people are always stigmatised wherever they are. But I think in in sort of where we live now, um, people draw a line and they know this, there's something wrong with this person. But it made me realise, experiencing it overseas, that in some countries, people have a really hard time with this. And, and so I've, I've adjusted my focus from... So they're trying to raise awareness from this country, in this country or in Europe, to more remote places. So next week I'm going out to co-direct and present a documentary on stigmatisation and persecution of uh, disabled people, but especially people with Parkinson's disease in Africa. I'm not going to say where I'm going, okay? Um, but you know that that's that's what I'm doing next week. But that's an eight-day shoot. Um, and we want to produce something cinematic and really moving, not just an infomercial, but something that's going to make heads of nation actually live up to the agreements they've ratified with human yeah. rights organisations. And if you look at some of the records or, or some of the 
uh, stories coming out of countries in Africa, it's horrific yeah. what is happening to people. Yeah. Um, not just simply lack of medication, but persecution to the most extreme level. Yeah. 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 When will that um, be available? Do you have a, a, a target release date for the documentary yet? We do, um, but there's lots of rules around that, about okay. our subsequent control of the documentary, which are ongoing. But it, right. I want it to, to reach mainstream news. That they're our ambitions for it, because we want to... We want, really want to sort of move people in this. So the more it's controlled by people, the less output I think there is. So it, it's probably going to be available in July, I would imagine. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good. Well, that Yeah, that's something I'm certainly interested in seeing because I've been to quite a few countries in Africa and I've seen some of what you're talking about. So I'm interested yeah. In, yeah. in seeing that. I don't want to tar the whole of Africa with the same brush at all. Absolutely um, not. That's no. definitely not the case. Um, but there are some quite horrific stories coming out of some areas. And it's not just restricted to Africa. It's just that's where I've worked every year for about the last 11 or 12 years. Yeah. But, but probably longer than that. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. And speaking, but I, I absolutely love Africa and I, I just find the people are amazing. Most of the people I meet yeah. are just absolutely amazing. I, I I love going back. Um, yeah. But yeah, th there are also instances that are, that are not good and they don't reflect well on anybody. It, it's, very, it's, it's very different sometimes when we view it from the lens through the sort of filter of ability. Yeah. Um, people are lovely, friendly, helpful. As soon as you have some sort of visible thing that they don't possibly understand, you experience things through the filter of disability. And and the stigmatization itself is really confidence knocking. And you I was subject to persecution as well. And yeah, it's very, very different. Very different. Yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. Okay. Um, is is there anything anything more you want to say on that while we're just talking about that subject? No. Well, my view is it, it's I have what I have, and it, it's not stopping me doing anything. Yeah, it is stopping me doing things at times, but um. I'm I'm gonna I'm belligerent belligerently carrying on, yeah. And I think that is a key um, skill to learn in photography, especially wildlife photography. It's a hard game, and and, and you know unless you're doggedly persistent in your pursuit of it, uh, you know, success is very difficult. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, that kind of brings me back to one of the things I like to end on, which is just any advice you have for people starting in wildlife photography. And you've obviously covered an important aspect there. Is there anything else that you'd like to add to that? Yeah, I would say don't follow all the other photographers. Um, I mean, you can go, I, I mean, I am going to the Masai Mara in a few weeks. You can go to the Masai Mara. Um, but it's been photographed to death. Yeah. Um, Svalbard has been photographed to death now. Um, my view is find an area that other people aren't doing or or aren't covering. I remember I I, I travelled a huge amount in areas of Brazil and the Pantanal region when I started there. There were hardly any photographers there, um, and that gives you a need straight away. Oh, sorry. That's my med timer. Um, so, um, yeah, that gives you a niche straight away. And also develop a, a passion for a subject as well. Because if you develop that passion for a subject, be it owls or, you know, wading birds or mammals, then 
you become obsessive with it. And if you become obsessive, then you you become, and I'm not going to say expert, but you become very knowledgeable in it. And the more you know your subject, the easier it is to photograph. Yeah. And what, what do you think about smartphones? Because I was looking at an ad or a video you have on your website using yeah. a smartphone, and that, I think, changes to some extent is a game changer. Um, yeah. Because I use, I mean, I use big DSLR when I go away, but I also have my smartphone. I use that for panos and videos and things like that. Yeah. What's your view on them? Um, well, I mean, we don't buy smartphones for the phone aspect anymore, do we? <laughs> the main thing that sells them is cameras, and and they are. I, I think there's a statistic that what is it? Ninety five percent of all photographs have been taken in the last five years. Um, because everyone's taking images. Yeah. Um, I think it's an incredible tool to have. Uh, I mean, people are producing television shows on a smartphone. Yeah. I think the latest, you know, recent iPhones filming ProRes Raw. Um, so, I mean, that's a phenomenal achievement. Yeah. And yeah, I did a, an ad for a company, I won't tell you who it was, but in Germany, and it was very successful. Um, and you know, I got an exhibition out of it in in um, Hamburg, and it was that was just from a smartphone. And yeah. you know, if, if you've got some wildlife phenomenon going on in front of you, and especially on the small scale, um, you know, you can get that phone right in there and. And as I think, as I say in that bit of film, the best camera you have is the one you've got in your hand. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, I think there's a lot being recorded that's um, that's really special now. And on a filming front, I mean, you can get some nice wide establishing shots just on a smartphone and a gimbal. Yeah. Or or mount it on a tripod, and you know, it's quite quite incredible what you can do. Yeah, now they're 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 it's certainly that I mean, the whole game has changed since um well, we were both starting with um film cameras. It's quite a different situation yeah, these days. Yeah. Yeah. There's one thing I'd like the manufacturer to change though is to rotate the sensor through ninety degrees. Oh, so when yeah. people film vertically, yeah, we still get a sixteen by nine that uh, aspect ratio. Yeah. Yeah, because when the, the some of this footage gets shown on news channels, they fill the the, the sixteen by nine space by blurred versions of the narrow aspect ratio they take, which is nine by sixteen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it used to be unusual to take a portrait format shot, and these days it's the norm. Normally, it was just landscape. And exactly that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I much prefer the the landscape. Yeah. yeah. Is, is there anything else you'd like to add before we wind things up? Um, it's wildlife photography is a hard game. It's never been cheaper or easier to get equipment to photograph wildlife really well. It's and just go for it. Be persistent. Keep going. Don't. I think one of the the most important things to learn as a photographer or any creative is how you uh, deal with rejection because um, yeah. you're going to be rejected a lot. Yeah. Um, and instead of being beaten down by rejection after rejection, um, you need to be inspirationally dissatisfied. And every editor that turned me down for a magazine article um, you know, 30 years ago, I used to just say, oh, well, sod you, I'm, I'm going to produce a, a, something you, you've never seen before, the best work ever. Yeah. And, and I think that inspirational dissatisfaction is definitely something to pursue. Yeah, treat it like a challenge. Yes, definitely. Yeah. That's brilliant. Well, look, David, I really appreciate you spending time with me, and um, I found it... Pleasure. It's, it's been really interesting and um, um, I do a sign off after this anyway, but for anyone who's interested in seeing more of David's work, 
in the um, podcast description, there'll be a link to David's Instagram and his website. And um, yeah, you can, you can find out more that way. So thanks again, David. I've really enjoyed our time. You're very welcome. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. And good luck, everyone out there as well. Now, I hope you enjoyed that. If you'd like to look at David's website, um, you can find him at uh, davidplummer.co.uk. Uh, Plummer is P-L-U-M-M-E-R. And you can find him on Instagram as David Plummer Images. So um, those links are in the description. And I'll speak to you again in the next podcast. Bye for now. I hope you enjoyed that podcast. Now, if you did and um, you're interested in wildlife photography or really a basic introduction to photography, I suppose, my next free webinar is taking place on Wednesday, the 31st of January. That's at 7 p.m. Central European time, so Paris time. And um, it doesn't really matter if you can't make the live event because everybody who registers, so once you register, I get your email address, uh, once the webinar has finished, normally one or two hours later, um, you will get uh, um, an email from me with a link to the recording. So uh, if you're not able to make the live event, if you're in Australia or somewhere else, that shouldn't be a problem. So that's on uh, Wednesday, the 31st of January. And there's a link in the description. It's on Eventbrite. And um, you can also find it on my website. So if you go to the website, you'll find the link there. Uh, and www.ge.photography should take you there. Okay, speak to you soon. Bye now.